new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy Grace and peace to you today, this wonderful Resurrection Day. We trust you enjoyed the worship and that you joined in on the worship uh, on today. And now we're we're, we're praying for you that you stay safe. We are uh, uh, under in place at home orders. And so the auditorium is empty. I miss the the Easter lilies and all the effects of, uh, of Easter service. But I'm glad to be joined to you by way of internet 
And so thank you for looking in on our uh, video presentation today. Uh, we love you and are praying for you. Stay safe. Do what you need to do. Wash hands. Wear masks. Uh, 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 abide by the rules and regulations, and, and we're going to trust God for all things. And to those of you that have lost loved ones and are grieving, uh, we have a word for you that the Lord loves you, and he knows what you are going through, and he's with you even now. God bless you. This would be a good time for you to probably uh, go and, and get some bread and water. Just put the tape on pause. Uh, uh, and because we're going to have communion at the end of this message. So you can get some water, some juice, and uh, a piece of bread, a cracker, and we all do it together. And this, is, this brings us together. As we are separated, we can be together in honoring uh, uh, one of the two mandates that the Lord gave us. And, and one was uh, the Lord's Supper, and the other one was baptism. And so we honor that, that mandate today because we gain strength from that celebration of his body and his blood. Well, we're going to move fastly into our message. And today's message is take a seat. Take a seat. The beauty of this resurrection day is that we have many benefits. A mending of our relationship with God, new life, new hope, the scripture says, O death, where is your sting? Another benefit is that the stinger has been taken from Satan. O grave, where is your victory? The grave doesn't have a victory because Jesus conquered the grave. We also have a new seat. And so this leads us fastly into our message. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 is our beginning and foundational text, and we're going to unpack it and just go straight through with it and give you some good information about what God would have you to know in this season of your life. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. But let's, let's backtrack, let's go back. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with these two words, but, and then because, Paul explained God's reason behind reconciling or pulling us back to himself. And these reasons are found totally in God. The reasons are his rich mercy and his great love which he focused on us. Yes, he directed it at us and not vice versa. The word tells us this in Romans 5 and 8, and this is the English Standard Version, but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet doing what we wanted to do, Christ died for us. Let's unpack some more. His great love with which he loved us. Some warp the idea of God's great mercy and love into something that justifies our pride. Some imagine that God loves us because we are so lovable. Is anything but that. Every reason for God's mercy and love is found in him. We give him no reason to love us. Yet the greatness of his love, he loves us with the great love anyhow. It's because he wants to. Amen. He wants to. Therefore, we must stop trying to make ourselves lovable to God. And simply 
receive his great love while recognizing that we are unworthy. When did he love us? The answer is when we were dead. This is when God started loving us. He did not wait until we were lovable or alive. He loved us even when we provided nothing for him to love. We were dead in trespasses and sin. What are trespasses? In trespasses and sin, the idea behind the word trespass is that we have crossed the line. We have breached the border. We've gone too far. We've gone a distance away from him. We challenged everything God gave us as boundaries. The idea behind the word sin is that we have missed the mark. The perfect standard of God. Stott has said, trespasses speaks of a man as a rebel. Sin speaks of man as a failure. Before God, we are, all, we are both rebels and failures. That's before salvation. Praise God. This is the requirement for being saved. You must first be dead. Dead to every attempt to justify yourself before God. John 5, 24 tells us, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. When you get saved, you, you pass from death to life. Then, then our scripture says, our key scripture says, he made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive together with Christ. This is what God did to those who were dead in sin. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus shared in our death so that we could share in his resurrection when he was raised up on that third day morning. The old man is crucified and we are new creations in Jesus. With the old things passing away and all things becoming new. And then in parenthetical notes in this scripture, it means it was added as a, as a side thought, by grace you have been saved. Paul is compelled to add here that this is the work of God's grace. His unmerited, his everlasting favor toward us. In no way involving our own merits or our own works or anything we can think to do to try to make ourselves more lovable. Our salvation, our rescue... From spiritual death is God's work done for the undeserving. And then, here is the next piece, which is marvelous. Raised us up together. Raised us up together. We died when Jesus died on Calvary, but we were raised when he was raised on that morning. Jesus' resurrection was a first fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, Eastern uh, 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 English Standard Version says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. What does the first fruit mean? It means it was the first of its kind to happen. There were other folk that were raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised. The widow named son was raised, and so forth and so on. But they all died again. 
but what makes Jesus a first fruit is that he got up and he stayed up and he's still up and he, he's still alive. And so when he got up, we were raised with him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We were raised to kingdom life. We were raised to kingdom deliverance, to kingdom exploits and conquest, and to kingdom rulership. Yes, when he raised us up, he raised us up to be rulers. Rulers operating in his grace, in his power that's available to us beyond our own ability. Once he raises you up, he does not leave you spinning in the air. He establishes you in a place of authority. How? Where? You might ask. Well, as we further unpack our key scripture, he said, He's made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is the present position of the Christian. Sitting in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. We have a new place for living. A new arena of existence. We are not those who dwell on earth as revelation often calls us. But according to Philippians 3 and 20... Our citizenship is in heaven. Now let me explain the sitting in, 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 in heavenly places. We don't sit in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. When he was resurrected and after he had tabernacled or hung out, showed himself to the apostles, showed himself to hundreds, yea, thousands of folk before he left. No, after his resurrection, he didn't rush away. He wasn't in fear, but he gave more charges to ministry. He sent folk forth. He gave them a witness that I have seen the risen Savior. And after a period of time, he went back and he joined himself to the Father in heaven and sat down on his right hand. So it says, when it says, we don't sit in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, Yet instead, we sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are on the earth, but we are sitting with him. We are in him, in heaven. We are in Christ. And so this is our identification. As he sits in heavenly places, so do we. And now we sit in heavenly places. We have a right to the kingdom of God. And it is a place of power. It is a place of authority. The seat that he is in. And it's close access to the Father so that anytime you fall short, Jesus doesn't have to go far to remind his Father uh, uh, of what was paid for them. And there is the cup of blood that he shed and paid the price for us. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, there is a story that I came upon by an unknown uh, uh, author. And it's about the, the ancient Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin court and how they rule. The ancient Jewish highest court, again, is called the Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin. They are what we know today as probably the federal court. Some people refer to them as the Supreme Court of Israel. The members of the Sanhedrin in that day sat in a semicircle that they might see one another while deliberating. Two clerks stood before them, one on the right side and the other on the left, to take down the votes. One to record the votes of acquittal and the other votes of condemnation. It also describes the role of the court clerks, which were also, they also were scribes. They recorded everything that happened. The arguments for acquittal 
and the arguments for conviction. They wrote all of it down. Upon reaching a verdict or judgment, the Sanhedrin would announce its verdict through either of the two clerks, the one on the right or the one on the left. The clerk which handles acquittals sits on the right hand, and the clerk who handles convictions and condemnation sits on the left hand. When the judges reach a verdict of conviction, the left clerk will declare the judgment of conviction and the accused is sentenced and condemned. If the counsel finds the accused innocent or not guilty, the clerk on the right declares that he is free to go. He is set free and declared righteous. Declared righteous. I was once asked, who would sit at the left hand of God the Father, our eternal judge? I honestly don't know, and I don't care. What I am concerned about is that Jesus, my advocate, is on the right hand of the court of heaven. He is there to pronounce my acquittal and to declare me righteous. That's why I can claim what scripture says, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hence, because of the work of Jesus, there is now no condemnation for me. Aren't you glad that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty and we are seated in him? I rejoice at that information. And on this day, you have reason to rejoice. If you have given your life to the Lord, you are seated in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. You are not hanging on the cross. You are not yet in the grave. You, you have joined him in his resurrection, following him as a first fruit of those who fell asleep. So we praise him for that today. Colossians 3 and 1 finally tells us, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Take a seat. Take a seat today. This resurrection, while you're wherever you are, know that you are seated in Christ Jesus. Blessings to you today. Let's pray for those. If you heard this message today and you haven't given the Lord your life, we're imploring you to surrender your life today. Come out of deadness. Come out of darkness. Come into the light. Forsake your sin. Repent. So repeat after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I repent of my sin and I give you my life. Today I make you Lord of my life because I make this confession of belief. I believe that one day Jesus died on the cross and that he went to the grave and after he went to the grave, he was resurrected on that third day morning by the glory of God. And on that confession, and on this statement, I am saved. God bless you. You have passed from death to life. Happy Resurrection Day to you. Now in keeping to what I said at the beginning of the message, as it relates to doing communion, I'm going to get my cup. and my wafer. And while you're at home, take your wafer or your bread or whatever you have that in the way of bread or cracker. And I'm going to read this and then I'm going to ask us to eat together. From 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26 is where these scriptures are coming from. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this 
in remembrance of me. God, we and we thank you for it. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for what you've done for us. So everybody, let's eat together. And then the Bible goes on to say, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for this payment. We thank you for what you did to us. And we thank you that we're in a, a, a better covenant based on better promises. Let us all drink together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this cup. We thank you for what you've done through us and for us. We thank you that you died for us, but you were raised up one, that, that Easter morning. And God, we bless you today, and we thank you. Let's receive a benediction to this service. It comes from number 6, 24 through 26. It's one of my favorite. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you, dear friends. Thank you for joining us in our video presentation and word message. We'd also like to encourage you to assist us in giving by going to our webpage and finding dubchurch.org, going to the giving link that will take you to our PayPal page. And we look forward to your support and your love. Thank you for tuning in. God bless.